Ah, super. Wow. Sounds powerful to me now. <laughs> Good. Well, anyway, Psalm 80 is where, we, where we're looking tonight, and that's the psalm that's been given to me. And in a wonderful way, it, it follows on very much from what we looked at last week when Bev wonderfully opened Psalm 44. Psalm 44 had to deal with an individual who was struggling with God. Tonight, it moves from the individual to the, to the group. You'll notice that all the way through, the psalmist is talking about us, 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 meaning all of us. And so it moves from the individual and their struggles to the group itself. And what I want to say kind of follows on a little bit from what, what Bev was leading us into last week. And it's certainly my experience that when God starts to repeat himself, he has something very important to say to us. And although Psalm 80 would not necessarily have been the psalm that I would have chosen, it's the one that God has for us tonight. And as you read this psalm, it's a bit of a puzzle, really, because superficially, at least, on the surface, things seem to be all right with this church. And things, as you know in life, aren't always as they appear. Uh, some, some years ago, my wife and I and our three children, who were quite young at the time, went away on an island just off Malaysia for a holiday in a very simple campsite, little thatched cottages, four, the five of us in the one in the one hut. It was run by a very fierce Chinese lady called Mrs. Wong. And she came bustling over and she said, um, uh, please come to the, the office and register and bring your passports, which I duly did. We were unpacking, Sue was unpacking. I took the five passports uh, and went over to see Mrs. Wong. And she did all her stuff and then gave them back to me. Now, one of them, none of them had names other than D. Picard or N. Picard or S. G. Picard. And my wife's uh, uh, name it was just S. J., but it had Dr. S. J. And as Mrs. Wong handed back the passport, she said to me, there you are, Dr. Picard, everything's in order. Now, you need to know that not every preacher is pristine and pure, because I thought, well, it doesn't do any harm to get a bit of street credit with Mrs. Wong. So I just said, yes, thanks, Mrs. Wong, and let her happily consider uh, that that's where I was. About three days later, she came rushing over to, to our hut, and uh, she said, Dr. Pickard, there is a real problem. One of the other campers is not well, has had a problem. Will you come over and help? <laughs> now, I don't know what you would do in those circumstances, but I only compounded my sin <laughs> by saying, look, I'm terribly busy with the children, Mrs. Wong, but, pointing to Sue, my assistant will go and... <laughs> so, now you know. Now you know. Things aren't always as they appear. And this church appears, at the very beginning, to be actually very much on the ball, a model church in many ways. I seem to be surrounded by lots of paper here, so excuse me while I reshuffle. But if you look at the psalm itself, it, it looks as if all is well. Now, we're talking about Judah, the southern kingdom. The, the nation of Israel has divided into two kingdoms, up in the north, ten tribes, and they have been swept away by the Assyrians, and they have gone into exile. Judah and Benjamin, the remaining two tribes, are still safe. They have not been swept away yet. And Jerusalem is safe. They haven't got into exile at all. Jerusalem is where the temple is, where God has promised to be there, put his presence there, and he's guaranteed to be there. So all should be well. If you look at their, their, their ascriptions, they know they seem to know God very well. He's their shepherd. What a wonderful picture that is. He's the mighty God. He is the Lord God Almighty. There's so much about him here. He's the powerful one. He's the one who is enthroned and rules from a place of power. And they know this. They're a worshiping people. 
Uh, actually, the, the, the psalm, it says, it's from the director of music to the tune lilies. It's, it's one of their worship songs. They're a praying people. They know their liturgy. They know their Old Testament. They know the blessing that God asked them to pronounce, that he would lift up the light of his countenance, his face, to shine upon them. They're a praying people. And there's everything about them that seems to be very, very wonderfully uh, on the ball. They know their church history. They know how God has redeemed them from Egypt through the mighty exodus and has brought them into the promised land. The spiritual routines are in place. And if you saw this as a church, if you saw this as a community of God's people, you might well think this is really good. They're on the ball. They know the Lord well. And yet, right at the beginning, there's a problem. Right at the beginning, there's a challenge. Right, the very first words, hear us. We're not getting through to you, Lord. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel. And in verses 3, 7, and 19, three times comes that plea, restore, restore, O God, to us. Make your face shine upon us. Something is wrong. They can't work it out yet. It's undefined. It's not clear. But something is not well spiritually with them. And you know, there are periods in the Christian life when we may seem to have it all together, and yet something is wrong, something is missing, something is not, not going well, things are not in place, there are frustrations, there are difficulties, and we can't put our finger on it. And at the moment, we can't, as we look at this psalm, put our finger on exactly what is the problem. On the surface, things look well, but they are not. And there are, for them, as with us, periods in our journey of faith when things seem to be out of sorts, out of kilter. It certainly happened to me. I can remember preaching or teaching in, a, in Korea at a, one of the student urbanas, uh, urbana meetings in Korea. Uh, large numbers were there, and as I was preaching, my interpreter, who was doing reasonably well, uh, and that's, a, that's not meant to be a, a derisory comment, that's, he was doing well with my English, but in the middle of it, he turned to me and said in Korean, what did you just say? And there was a huge burst of laughter around the meeting. And I said to the Lord, I feel utterly humiliated. Don't ever ask me to go on a platform again if that's what I'm exposed to. And there are periods for all of us when something doesn't seem to go right and we feel frustrated. <laughs> there are difficulties and struggles. And that's what we discover with this church. Hear us, O Lord. And yet, if you looked at it, it's routines, it's traditions, it's liturgy, it's worship, all seem to be in place. But something was missing and here's the thing their spiritual routines did not match reality their spiritual routines did not match reality you can't fault their theology you can't understand their grasp of history their church history the things that God has done you cannot fault them and yet for all that they're struggling they're struggling profoundly and deeply. And I have to say, it's really important for us to understand that getting things right with our theology, with our grasp of how we do things, the patterns, the routines, the structures that we have, which are fine, but they are there, not as ends in themselves, but to lead us into an encounter with the living God. They have an intellectual grasp of their faith. They know what they have been taught. They know the right answers, but they are not experiencing God with them. Hence the plea, Lord, three times, restore us and let your face shine the blessing of the presence of God. 
The question is not did they get 10 out of 10 for their theological soundness. Now that's not the question. The question is, is God present? Is God among them? Is the living, active, interfering, nourishing, caring, shepherding God at work in their midst? And clearly he is not. Hence their appeal. Where are you, God? Shine your face of blessing on us. And what does it feel like to them? It feels like they are in some kind of spiritual exile. Yes, their brothers, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes have been swept away by the Assyrians, scattered among the nations, into exile, away from God. And in a sense, you can feel their distress here of a kind of spiritual exercise, a separation and a loss. Listen to their praying. Lord, you fed us with the bread of affliction. You made us drink tears by the bowlful. Why is your anger smoldering against us? There's something wrong and you're not there and we're not being blessed. It feels like a place of darkness. It feels like a place where God is absent and they're longing for home and he's not there. It's a place and a realization of something's been lost and they don't know how to get it. Hence, and listen carefully, their passionate, single-minded plea to the Lord, make your face shine on us. And it is an urgent plea, and you'll notice the crescendo of increasing intensity. Verse three, restore us, O God. That's where they've begun. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved, that we may be blessed, we may be set free, we may be lifted up again into your presence. Restore us, O God. Verse seven, restore us, God Almighty. There's no limitation there from you. You're the Almighty One. You could do it. So please do it. Verse 19, restore us, Lord Lord God Almighty. The longer it goes on, the more intense is their praying. And the key reference is, of course, to that passage in Numbers when God says this to Moses, this is how you are to bless my people. This is how you are to pray that I will pour out my blessing, my presence, my joy, and everything else that goes to, with knowing God. This is it. You are to pray. You are to pray. Lift up the light of your countenance. Be gracious to us. Shine on us. And it's a wonderful cry for help. And they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Anyone here in trouble tonight? Anyone who's jogging along but finding the routines of life difficult, a struggle, finding that God somehow has walked away and you're on your own. What are the steps to recovery? What are the steps to recovery? Because this psalm has recovery all the way through. The routines didn't match reality. What you saw was what was not what it was like underneath. And God doesn't judge from the outside. He looks deep inside. Where is the heart? Where is the love? Where is the devotion to me? And the steps to recovery are very simple and very plain. Firstly, you need to recognize reality, realism, facing up to reality. And they face up to reality with almost brutal honesty. And you know, God only begins to deal with us and restore and bless us when we are absolutely and sometimes brutally honest with ourselves. It is well with my soul, but is it? And here they are, very honest. Hear us, O shepherd. You're supposed to be our shepherd. 
and we don't have a sense of your loving shepherdness. You've made us drink tears by the bowlful. There's no, no pretense in these words. There's no embellishment. There's no way of excusing or giving reasons or trying to find a, a what, what's going on. It's an utter, open-hearted, transparent confession to God. God, realistically, we are in profound, deep trouble. And recognizing reality means saying unequivocally how really needy we are. Not how we're getting along, bumping along on the bottom, but how really needy we are and how helpless we are. And despite all our activities and programs, how we have not yet seen the blessing of God. Let me read you something that um, I came across again. Um, some, it took place some years ago. It took place by the founder of the China Inland Mission. At a time when the mission had many, many colleagues in China. And the leader, Hudson Taylor, issued a circular to every member of the China Inland Mission. A man that God was blessing, a man that God has used as perhaps one of the greatest missiologists and Christian missionaries in the past 150 years. But here's what he wrote to every member. He said, few of us are satisfied with the results of our work. And some may think that if we had more or more costly machinery programs, we would do better. But oh, I feel that it is divine power that we want and not machinery. God blesses people, not programs. It is people he fills with his spirit, not people. Shouldn't we do well to suspend our present operations and give ourselves to humiliation and prayer and for nothing less than to be filled with the spirit of God? Chinese are dying without Christ for lack of power. Now he didn't just say this. A few, about a few weeks, two, two or three weeks later, he suspended all the meetings of the councils of the China Inland Mission. And the minutes of that meeting were very simple. And for a week, they stopped meetings to discuss plans and outreach and to pray. The minutes of the meeting read as this. Instead of meeting for conference, the China Council united with members of the mission in Shanghai to seek for themselves and the whole mission and for the people of God in China that the Holy Spirit would come and fill those missionaries. That's been a challenge to me in my leadership in the OMF, the successor to the China Inland Mission how easy it is to try and find other reasons and to neglect the need to come before the Lord and plead that he would empower us. So recognizing reality involves a self-examination where we don't try and gloss over our mistakes, our weaknesses, our failures. Because it's not great people that God blesses. It's not accomplished people. It's not, it's not people who have it all together that God uses. It is the weak and the foolish that God anoints. You notice too how God is active in this psalm. He seems to be putting his face against him. It seems almost hard to believe. Now why does God do that? I'll tell you why he does it. He does it in order to bring us to our senses and to bring us to a place where we seek him and where, as he says in his word, if you will seek me with your whole heart, you will surely find me. 
God is not hard to find, but he wants wholeheartedness. He wants people whose ambition is to know God. He wants people like Paul who to say, for me to live is Christ. I want to know Jesus. Whatever things were gained to me, I count but lost. They're rubbish that I may gain Christ, may know him, and may know the power of his resurrection and embrace the fellowship of his suffering. It's really tough stuff. But if God is going to pour out his spirit in blessing, then we need to face reality as these people did. Restore, O oh God, Restore us. Make your face shine upon us. Here's the second step, and that is to reach out to God. Recognize reality and then reach out to God. They turn to him. They're reaching out. And there are two words here that I want to underline. We've met the word restore. Restore to us. And that little phrase that reoccurs, it's, it has this meaning, as if something has been taken away. Please give us back what we've lost. Please give us back what we've lost. That's, that's the thrust. Restore. Something's been taken away. Restore it. Give it back to us. I suppose for me, thinking very unspiritually, this happened to, to Sue and I when we were traveling to Australia. And a friend had said, please, coming from Singapore, will you bring some barbecue pork? It is so delicious, and we can't get it in Australia. And uh, so we, we said, sure, of course we will. And we traveled, got to Australia, got to a passport stamp, got to immigration and the customs, and they said, well, do you want the good news or the bad news? We said, okay, well, let's have the good news. He said, the good news is your luggage is going to be lighter because you cannot take barbecue pork into Australia. Absolutely nothing doing, hard cheese, it's taken away, you've got to leave it here. Well, that's actually the bad news. But here's the other side of the good news. When you come to leave Australia, it'll still be here. <laughs> and it doesn't go off, it's edible. So the good news is you will get it back. And here's the Israelites pleading with God, whatever has been taken, please restore it. Restore to me, says the psalmist, the joy of my salvation. I've lost it. But there's another word that links in, these, in this threefold plea that, that is being made to God, and that's the word return. And this is a much more personal word. It has to do with a personal relationship. It has to do with the fact that we cannot, says the psalmist, we cannot turn to you. You have turned away from us. Please turn back. Turn round that we may see the brightness of your presence. We may experience the joy of God with us. But hidden in that word is also this little thought, crucial thought, that we can't turn ourselves. God, please turn us around. Turn us around. Please help us. We cannot turn ourselves. Have you reached that point? In your journey with God, have you reached a point where you've got to say to the Lord, I can't do it. Please help me. Turn me. Change my attitude. Change my priorities. I am struggling. And I've lost the blessing. Where is the blessing once I knew when first I knew the Lord? It's gone. Lord, turn me around to know and to love you. Turn. It means humbling ourselves. It means coming to the Lord afresh, acknowledging our utter hopelessness and powerlessness. Not by doing more, not with, not with to-do lists, arm-length to-do lists of things that I promise to do if 
It is saying, unless you, Lord, work in my life, it's not going to happen. But there's a third step. The road to recovery, face up realistically. Recognize realism. Secondly, reach out to God. And thirdly, the final crucial appeal is to God himself to revive, to reignite, to energize us, them. Comes right towards the end of the chapter, end of the psalm itself. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you've raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and then we will call on your name. We'll call on you with, with sincerity, with faith, with energy, with power. Revive us, Lord. And it's that plea to God himself. Let the ha your hand, your hand, your right hand, the hand of power, rest on the man at your right hand, the one that you have raised up for yourself. Then, then, will be able to return to you. Now, who was the man at God's right hand here? Well, it's messianic to the, to the psalmist. It's looking forward to the Messiah, the Christ, the Redeemer, the Savior, the one who can rescue. For us, we know that that is Jesus. The man at God's right hand is Jesus Christ. And Peter understood this in the, in the day of Pentecost. When filled with the Spirit, as God moves, he made these words. God has raised up Jesus. He's raised him to life, and we are witnesses of it. He, Christ, is exalted to the right hand of God. Christ has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and poured that out as you now see and hear. The evidence was all around. The man at God's right hand, Jesus Christ, Whoever lives to make intercession for us. To whom is the final appear? It is to Christ, the man at God's right hand. The man who has been through it all. The man who has endured separation from God, as Bev reminded us, in the most excruciating way. As he cried on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And knows what it is to lose the presence of God much more than we do. He's there. He's there to rescue and to save. God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ, Savior and King. Revive us, Lord, by the man at your right hand, and we will call on your name. Lord, we can't, you can. The sense of this word revive carries that meaning, only God can bring the life and the power and the energy and the love that we need in order to serve him. And it is through Jesus that the psalmist and us find a solution when we have lost the presence of God. They were asking, weren't they, shine your face, we need light. We need light. And I think there are some of us here this evening who are in darkness, struggling, all kinds of personal needs, choices, difficult choices, what to do. And to those in darkness, Jesus, the man at God's right hand says, I am the light of the world. I think these people in the psalm were struggling like lost sheep, scattered perhaps feeling the, the ravage of, of, of other people, of, of their neighbors. I mean, it's, it's here, isn't it? You've made us a mockery to our neighbors. It's as if wild animals are just running rampage over us, and we're as, as if we've been scattered. <coughs> and I think there are some people here tonight who feel very scattered and separate lost touch with each other and with the living God and to those who need shepherding, who need care, who need to restore. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. 
People here are feeling powerless, knocked down, weary, and depressed, aren't they, in the psalm? And I think there are people here feeling weary, burdened, for all sorts of reasons, and there seems to be no release. The Lord Jesus stood among people who were busy, frantically busy about their religion, and just held out his hands and said, Come unto me, all who are burdened, weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest and if the sun sets you free the man at God's right hand sets you free you really are free maybe the sum of us just weary and well doing it's one more meeting it's one more program it's one more exhortation and Jesus says no come to me don't try and polish the halo. Come to me and I will give you rest. Maybe these people in the psalm were feeling thirsty and dry. They drank tears by the bowlful. Tears are salty. I should think they had a raging thirst. And I think some of us are thirsty for God. And the Lord Jesus stood the stairs to the temple and said if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water and ultimately it is Jesus Christ himself who turns us around Christianity following Jesus is not a duty it's a joyful walk with one who said follow me and I'll change things for you I will make you somebody very different do you know a lot about God and yet does he still feel distant to you then the answer is come to Christ I'm going to close with a, a personal anecdote that goes back many years it goes back to 1962 which is probably a long way for some of you, not so long for others. At that stage, I had been a Christian. I was converted at a Billy Graham rally in London, came to Christ. I was baptized and I was a church member. And then gradually, I began to drift. Never lost my faith, or at least my belief in God, but he became very distant very remote and in my secular career in management in the British motor industry when there was one as that was ascending so my life was drying out day by day if you asked me do you still believe in God I would have said yes do you know him in your life I would have said no and one day I came, went back to the flat. I shared a flat with three other single men in London. And I felt very desperate. And I went into my room and I knelt down by my bed. And I did something I hadn't done for four or five years. I said, Lord, I cannot make any sense of my life. What it's for, where I'm going, what I should do with it. Yes, I've got a career and it's rising. But that doesn't seem to be the point. Where are you? Who are you? I cannot make sense of my life. So there and then, Lord, I'm offering you back my life. As it is, without conditions, without strictures, without any complicated promises other than he can have it all. Lord, you must have it all. And God met with me that night and turned my life around. He gave me a love for the Bible and the Word of God. And from that moment, that moment on, he redirected my steps, eventually to marriage, eventually to go to Asia in 1970 with Sue and raise a family there and see God work among people who were hungry for God, who longed to know freedom that Jesus brings. It was a turning point of huge significance. And that's what this psalmist is saying, revive, turn us 
We can't do it, Lord. We're looking to you to do it for us. I'm going to close with a hymn in a moment, but I want to do so, say something to you tonight. It's very easy to, to come to the end of a service and we're going to sing a hymn that we sang last week that speaks about God bending us and molding and shaping us and to restore us. And it's very easy at the end of that hymn to close and finish and to go home. But as I look out to you and as I know my own heart, I want to, you to stop and reflect and pause and pray quietly. God says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. If you seek me with all your heart, you will surely find me. And let me recommend that to you as we sing this final hymn together, a hymn for revival, a hymn for God to bless us. At the end of that, I'm going to have, there'll be a pause and a quiet, and then I will pray and close the meeting. But would you stand with me as we sing this wonderful hymn, a hymn that is a prayer, a hymn that is a plea, really. Restore, O oh Lord, the honor of of your name in works of sovereign power come shake the earth again the last verse bend us O Lord where we are hard and cold and in your refiner's fire here's permission for God to use whatever method he chooses to refine the gold of our faith so let's sing this hymn together